He takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what we're going to do today? We're going to start a new book. First, Timothy. Then we'll be doing Second Timothy. It's good to be back and get back in our Father's Word. Not that I ever left it. I guarantee you that. But Timothy is a special book. It's one of the three doctrinal books, basically, that Paul utilized with First, Second, and Titus, of Timothy, that is to say, telling him how to operate the church, but also it tells you how to operate your family. So it's very good advice on how to deal with the message that Almighty God left us through the Son, how you should handle it. Timothy means uh, valuable to God or, or dear to God, and indeed he was. What do we know about Timothy? Well, some believe he had a Gentile father with a Hebrew mother. Uh, it, that is a possibility, be that as it may. It would fit the fact that this is a message to the Gentile, or basically, let's take the shortcut, whomsoever will. But at the same time, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were very strong Christians. They were Christian women that are mentioned in God's Word, that were servants of God. And it's uh, understandable how quickly Timothy took to Paul's message because he had had this proper um, upbringing and, and it kind of showed. So with that having been said, a doctrinal book telling you how the doctrine of Christ should be handled and taught. First uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, verse 1 reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You know, when we translate those names, there is so much written in that first verse. What, what uh, the apostle, Paul an apostle, what does that mean? Paul one sent forth. That's what the word apostle means. Sent forth for what purpose? Of Jesus Christ, Jesus being Yeshua's Savior. That's to say God's Savior, Christ, Christ Christos, the Anointed One, by the commandment of Yahweh, our Savior. It is God that is the Savior over all, but He sent His Savior, which is to say the Son. So what a title, what a commission that Paul carried. Verse 2, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, in the spiritual sense of conversion, very special lad, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace being that unmerited, unmerited favor, that love sent forth by God. God's love is so special. It can be tough love or it can be a warming love, warming in both cases. But to understand our Father, you must understand that from wisdom comes the ability to love because with wisdom gained from our Father in from, and from His Word teaches you those things that cause you, as the name Timothy, valuable to God, to be valuable to God, a protector of His Word, a crusader, and one that would carry forth that Word. And certainly Timothy had been chosen by Paul, knowing he had the ability to protect the doctrine, to lock it in, whereby man could not change it with the traditions of men. Verse 3, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. 
that's important. Simple? Of course it's simple. But, you know, it is human nature that people like to mess with doctrine. They like to hear strange speech even sometimes. That's it. Compared to your salvation by the Savior, which is to say Almighty God, sometimes you can kind of play with fire if you're not mature with a, an analytical mind or, or a mind that can analyze, let's put it that way, with spiritual discernment to be able to cull out that that is false and fake and stick with the simplicity of the doctrine of Christ. Christ's doctrine is simple. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would have everlasting life. Everlasting means eternal. And God sent him in his own person that he being the Savior, Yahweh, that is to say, and making that love available to whomsoever would follow the doctrine. So you see, though the simplicity in which the doctrine is taught, it is very valuable to you to see that man does not change it through traditions. Verse 4. Neither give heed to fables, that's falsehoods, and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Now, many people get carried away by that verse and feel that they should drop genealogies altogether. That isn't what he said needless or endless or foolish genealogies, Christ wanted, and through the Father, wanted us to have nothing to do with them. And you can go in circles. You could even do this by making that within itself a ministry all of its own. But if you were not familiar with the genealogies of Christ, how, how, will, how could you have the key of David? You couldn't. So do you feel that, and many people would say all the genealogies of the Bible then you should drop. Do you think God is foolish? Because that's what you would be calling him if you said there were no need for those genealogies. For it is through those gene genealogies that you know, the, you know the seed through which the true Christ, not the false, comes. And who it is that you are to adhere or listen to and who you are to put aside, cast away. So be very careful in your reading. There's a great deal of difference in fables and endless genealogies and the generations that brought forth the Christ child, who is the Savior, whereby you have truth rather than fables. Verse 5. Now, the end of the commandment is charity. That's to say love. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. That is to say one that is genuine. A faith that has no doubt in the word. Now, again, some people hear the word love and they just melt uh, like... Um, um, cheese over a toasted cheese sandwich into nothingness, a wet noodle. Love comes in many forms. You must love your enemy, which means, and you must love your child. And if you love your child, you're going to correct him. If you love your enemy, you're going to correct him as well. Sometimes love comes in the form of tough love, and that's real love. Because if you care enough, that if you see a brother about to step into the fire to pull him from it, then some, that, that takes love. Otherwise, you could just not give a care and let him go. Love. It is... Um, um, no teaching is of any value unless it helps to produce love. I'm going to say that again. No teaching is of any value 
unless it produces love, which is to say caring in the family of God. Verse 6. From which some, having severed or swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. This word jangling is an interesting word. I suppose we could update it today and call it a ratchet jaw. Somebody that just talks, 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 talks. It always, you know, and never says anything. Never produces the love of God. You have many cases of this in this modern generation where it would seem that through the name Savior, people think that's, that's the only message there is, is salvation, which is, is, which is probably one of the top lessons of God's Word, salvation. But once you're saved, it's a sin if you keep teaching that locked up little congregation salvation when they're all saved. There's so much more meat and whereby people can mature, they must have the meat of God's Word or you're not going anywhere. It reminds me, and we were given a prime example of a jangling. And that's what the book of Job is about. Job in the Hebrew tongue meaning persecuted. But you got 38 chapters of jangle, 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 ratchet jaw, ratchet jaw. And finally, in Job chapter 38, uh, verse 2 or 3, which is at 2, I believe, God said, Job, why do you want to listen to a bunch of fools? Why? He says, why don't you, where were you when I put this earth in its present position? In other words, why don't you listen to me instead of a bunch of fools? Because you have God's word. God wanted so much to take pride in Job that Satan couldn't tempt him. He was proud of Job. But you'll never find a better example of where jangling will take you. Some preacher that blows hot air for 30 or uh, minutes to an hour and never really says anything from God's word or this doctrine in securing the doctrine and anchoring it in your mind whereby it gives you direction and brings forth love rather than splitting families. If your family is not spiritually prepared from the word, there's going to be trouble. So beware of janglers, ratchet jaws that talk, 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 words, words, words. Too many words and you lose sight of the truth. Keep it simple. Keep it direct. And let it be God's word that you study, not the words of men. Verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In other words, they go back to the traditions of men. They don't know what the law is. We live in a generation where some even teach the laws done away with. And they show their ignorance not being able to discern between commandments, statutes, ordinances, and law. The law is not done away with. The law keeps you out of trouble. Do you know what sin is? First epistle of John, you're not going to have it, but make a note of it. First epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 4. Don't ever forget it. If you want to know what sin is, that's where it's written. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is, and I repeat, sin is the transgression of the law. Example, use common sense. What does the law say? Let's take the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Do you think that's done away with? Do you think it's all right for one neighbor to abuse another by stealing his goods? I think not. And if you are a thief, you end up in jail where you belong. So certainly, if some jangle mouth tells you the law was done away with and you're no longer under it, steal something and then go to jail as you are caught and see if saying, I love Jesus, gets you bail. 
Now, your ignorance of the Word will not save you, nor will Christ help you by pleading ignorance. If you're honest with Him and promise you'll start studying His Word, you see, Blood ordinances, yeah, that was done away with through Christ's blood having been shed. Hebrews chapter 10 documents that to the letter. But the law is good. It's man that's bad. If you never break a law, you'll never be in trouble, aside from being in the trouble for the name of Christ. But it is the law itself that keeps you out of trouble and we all fall short in that occasionally we mess up. But don't ever let some ratchet jaw tell you that the law is done away with. You shall not murder. And anytime you break one of God's natural laws, you're going to get in trouble. Anything that is unnatural is not of God. That that is unnatural is a perversion of God's word and he will not tolerate it. Verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Well, how does a man use it lawfully? Well, you have to know what the law is. We've got too many scripture lawyers that profess to be law yours of our, our understanding God's law, but really know not the difference between an ordinance or the law. It's a sad situation. A wise person recognizes first off that in applying the law that you have to know both sides of a situation. And my friend, as each person has a different set of fingerprints, usually there is a different turn to every person's personal failure as far as law is concerned. So one never judges without hearing both sides, and one never judges without having all information, and uh, perhaps I should use the word discern rather than judge, for it is not ours to judge. Verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, a man that does what's right is not going to break the law. You got it? But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. In other words, I'm, I'm glad this is translated fanyance from murder and murderer rather than simply the word kill so that you know there is a great difference in executing a murderer. We're supposed to. We're supposed to practice capital punishment. Many say, well, that is not a deterrent. Oh, yes, it is. I guarantee you there is not one case in history where a man that murdered someone on being hung or executed has ever killed anyone else. So the law identifies the breaker thereof by his deeds and by a breakdown in the community and the suffering of those that have to abide a criminal, which is to say one who breaks law. Verse 10. This goes more to the moral sense for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, that means those that practice slavery, for liars, for perjured persons, those that will swear to a lie, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, that is to say, anything that is contrary to the natural order of things. You know, the word defile here in the English, I want you to check that out in the Greek. Do yourself a favor. Underline the word defile and check it out in the Greek to understand what defile themselves with mankind means. The word defiled is made up of two words. It means male, 
and um, it means uh, couching, crouching, or male sperm. It means male working that with male. It means perversion, and it means trouble. And uh, the, the English is mellowed out to where the word of God loses by simply the word defile themselves with mankind. The word defile in the Greek makes it very clear what's spoken of here. It should be adhered to. Well, my goodness, are you, don't you afraid you, are you afraid you might offend someone? No, I'm not afraid of offending anyone with God's word. Why? True love keeps them from catching diseases that will kill them. I love all of God's children. I don't want to see them die. Therefore, truth and the sound doctrine saves lives. Why? Because it always instills love. Again, I will repeat in case you missed, take your Strong's Concordance, convert the word defiled as used in 1 Timothy chapter 10 back to the Greek and it, you will find there that it is, consists of two Greek words, all right? Verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, Paul on the road to Damascus that day, there wasn't an altar call. He didn't volunteer. He was struck down. God chose him, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. God chose him and gave him a three-level commission on who he should take the word to and on the three levels he should teach. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled or made me able, enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. And there it was, again, a, a full report of it. You'll remember in Acts 7, Paul at that time was called Saul. And they actually laid the clothing of the men that murdered Stephen at his feet. So he had a lot to account for. Paul certainly did. But God chose him from before. Verse 13 who was before a blasphemer, this was Paul, and a persecutor and injurious. Oh, he, he hurt the church. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was zealous for the old school of thought. And um, as far as he was concerned, he was practicing his religion in destroying the church. But God saw to it that in his conversion, and after that conversion and after God chose him, in taking all things into consideration, that in as much as we have an eternal father, that his plan is from beginning to end. And it's very difficult sometimes for man to see the beginning as well as the end and the different dimensions added there too. Verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That love is there. Have you ever felt it? Have you ever really reached out for him and felt the eternal love that is available for those who participate by earnestly seeking, reaching out, asking, you know, after all, you are his child. He is your father. He loves you. He may not love what you're doing, but he does love you. Else he would not have created you. He would not have created your soul. Verse 15, this is a fateful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Boy, listen to that, what a lead. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
He did not come to the world to save righteous people because a person that is righteous would have already been saved. He came to save those that were lost. And in understanding the first earth age and the rebellion of Satan and how that God blinded certain ones that rather than destroying the third that followed Satan, they would have this age to attain salvation if they should choose to love him. Verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, that's to say patience, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That is to say, to have life eternal. What Paul say there? Paul said, it was for this reason that God chose me to be a type. That if a person could be so bad as I was bad in persecuting the very work of God, thinking I was doing right, that it shows his patience with man to be patient enough with me that he could allow me to participate in Stephen's death, that is to say to hold the clothing, to give approval, and to still be anxious and zealous to persecute the church it shows the outreaching and overreaching of God's patience with us. Some of you think, well, I'm so bad I could not be saved. That's why Paul was used as a type to show you that God loves you and he has patience in and with and for you also. That's what he's talking about of that, this being a true saying, that your father does love you. I don't care how bad you are, that when on repentance, he paid the price that you have forgiveness. You have a clean, fresh start in life. Why? Your father loves you. Again, you might ask yourself, well, why would he choose Paul on the road to Damascus? I thought you had to go down front at an altar call. Uh-uh. Paul earned the right from before. He was, as I quoted in Acts 9, 15, a chosen vessel. God chose him because of what happened from before. If you don't understand that, place it on a shelf for a moment. Verse 17, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. There is so much said in that that you can simply read over in the English if you're not real careful. King eternal is king of the aeons. That means king of the ages, the first earth age, this earth age, and the one coming. There is no other king. He's it. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords, King of kings. He's the king you can count on. Immortal in as much as that he is, I am that I am. Invisible in that in various dimensions, it would be impossible for someone in a fleshly body to see him. As it is written, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? There's it's a different dimension. And I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15. But he is a God of honor. Why? For within him there is no dishonor. He's fair in all his judgments. You get what you've got coming to you. So expand your horizon with the wisdom of God to understand the simplicity in the doctrine of Christ that is pulled forth in this book, this doctrinal teachings given from Paul delivered to Timothy on your behalf. Verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies 
which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Do you understand that Christianity is, will bring forth war, especially in this particular generation? It is almost laughable to certain misguided, miserable wretches, socialists, when they mention God's book or Christianity. There is a war between God and Satan. And it is warfare. It's a war of love, love of truth, of doing that that is right and to save as many of those poor, miserable, socialist souls as is possible that will come to wisdom and let the rest go wherever they might. Our only responsibility is bringing forth truth. There is a war. There is a very definite war, a spiritual war. So I've, uh, please understand what I'm saying. And you can feel it. You feel that that is warm and that that is fair. And as the wicked open their mouths in their socialist way, you see, anything toward anti-godliness, which is socialist being the offspring of communism that pulls away from God and God's word, is demonic. Well, but they're such nice people. You call them whatever you like. Listen to their mouth. Even watch their tongue as it brings forth and spews that that is of Satan rather than that that is of God. My friends, you live in a very precious generation. You live in a generation that that war will transpire. A fantastic generation. Even the prophets wanted to live at this time. You do. See that you make the best of it. With him, you always have the victory. You don't have to sweat it. Never let him see you sweat on your first cruise. We got it made. We're the victors. They can cry, moan, groan, do whatever they want to. We have the victory. Verse 19, holding faith. What is faith in the gospel armor? It's your shield and a good conscience. What is that? It's your breastplate, that that protects your body, which some having put away, in other words, they literally despitefully cast it from them, putting away, concerning faith have made shipwreck. It will shipwreck a life, you will see trouble, you will see unfairness, you will see sickness, and the misleading of people when it comes to those that practice that unfairness of the next thing to mocking God himself. We live in a fine generation that you don't have to look very far to recognize the workings of Satan. What really, and as much as this is a doctrinal book, why wouldn't he tell us what to do with them? Oh, he will, last verse of chapter one, verse 20. Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander? Well, who was Hymenius and Alexander? Well, they, they uh, would not accept the word of God. They vehemently dis, uh, disagreed with, uh, denied the resurrection. That's to say the New Testament. So what should you do with them then? Whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let them go to the devil. That's what he said. Why? Well, as he would say in the book of Corinthians to a person that practiced incest, he led him over to the devil so he could learn a lesson. You know, when a man gets deep enough in the gutter that there's no place but up, He's already gone down as far as down will go. And there's no place but to look up. Then just maybe he will remember spiritually from whence he came. And it will be recalled to his memory. 
and he will cry out, Father, help me, as the prodigal son did. I don't know, you may be a prodigal son or daughter. And talk to him. He is your father. He knows what you're thinking. He cares about you. This is the doctrine that was delivered from Almighty God himself. We have the victory. We're the winners. So look up, saints. Our redemption draweth nigh. Our victory is in sight. We have that victory. Always keep your warfare in order when you fight against the fiery darts of the devil. All right, bless your heart, you listen.